The 1890s are an elusive era in oceanic history, far less discussed when they're practically screaming to be. I've thrown my hat in the ring once or twice when it comes to ships, so I figure I'll take a shot at tackling some well-known but lesser-mentioned vessels from the era. It's the same reason I discussed the Teutonic Twins. It's a forgotten time that really needs to be better taught. People in these parts worship the Olympic class and all the ships around that era. But I figure, let's mix it up a bit. In my opinion, the Golden Age of Ocean Liner design came about in the early 1890s. And yes, then it carried on through the early 20s. But we've got to start somewhere, so let's go over that early 1890s thing a little bit more. The era preceding this Golden Age of design, sure, it had some beauty, but was more focused on functionality and quality rather than grandeur. The era preceding this one had mostly sailing ships or paddlewheel steamers for transoceanic travel. Sure, there are some grand paddlewheel steamers out there, but the majority of those passenger ships were not designed to be luxurious, often carrying the bare minimum of accommodations to survive. This was the Industrial Revolution. Lower class quarters were filthy, neglected, and weren't cleaned until the end of the voyage so inspectors wouldn't report them. The 1870s, specifically the Oceanic class, was the first sign that this wouldn't remain the standard. The White Star Line was trying to raise the bar to get more business, and it really worked. The Oceanic class is viewed as the clear point of divide between the old and new for ocean liners, and for good reason. By increasing the quality of life on board, White Star created new standards that would slowly continue raising the bar on passenger accommodations. This new system carried over to the other steamship companies of the time, Cunard Line specifically. They'd been around since the 1830s, but much like White Star, they were creating better accommodations early on to capitalize on passenger service. By the early 1880s, Cunard had developed a series of successful steamers with decent to excellent accommodations, and they were preparing to develop new oceanic giants to remain ahead of the curve. Hopefully this time to try and beat White Star's successful Teutonic class. Yes, I'm aware most of you are rooting for White Star, I'm doing a Cunard video, suck it up. Now this era was one of major nautical development across the board, and naturally this applied to naval development as well. The British Admiralty had a pretty great fleet at this point, but naturally they wanted more. What if America wanted round 3? What if France wanted round 35? Cunard decided to approach the Admiralty about making their new liners able for war. This type of ship was referred to as an armed merchant cruiser and would prove to be floating dumpster fires. But they didn't know that yet. The government said they would fund the construction of the new class on the condition that they were specifically designed to be converted. Cunard agreed and the construction of RMS Campania and Lucania began. By the way, I'm using the pronunciation of the Italian regions as per Google, so if I mispronounce it, that's on Google. These were to easily be the largest ships in the world aside from the train wreck that was the Great Eastern. Campania and Lucania were to be twin screw steamers. They also would have the largest triple steam reciprocating engines in the world, also the largest ever fitted to a Cunard ship. With 12 double-ended scotch boilers, a donkey boiler, and an immense amount of power sitting in the engine room, the ships would easily be the fastest vessels in the world. But before we get onto that, let's discuss their interiors. They both had nearly identical insides with Victorian influence and their luxurious stylings with lots of dark wood paneling, mostly mahogany, oak, and satin wood. As seen here on their grand staircases, it was a much darker aesthetic than most other ocean liners had, but still a very intricate design, like on her railing here with the fleur-de-lis thing going on. Thick carpeting covered the floors and the iconic Cunard ceiling elements seen on later ships such as the Lusitania were present too. They both still had a dining saloon, it was the 1800s after all, but nonetheless it was grand, comparable to second class dining accommodations on the Olympic class 20 years later. Now the second class accommodations were far plainer and although it still had dark colors, it had far less carvings, engravings, or pillars. Second class cabins were much the same, mostly uninteresting and designed to be merely functional, not necessarily unappealing though. They still had their own private smoke room and deck space, but it really doesn't knock me over. Now if you want to sail on third class and are trying to find the best accommodations, keep looking. I couldn't find any photos of the third class, but from what I've read it was good for the time but grew outdated as the years went by. Now the Campania was launched on the 8th of September 1892, which was only a little less than a year after its keel was first laid down. Her maiden voyage was in the following April, and it was upon her maiden voyage that a particular issue was discovered. Vibrations were a particularly modern problem of ships of the era, and this was a testament to how speed was becoming such a priority for major shipping lines. Large engines on large ships require a lot of power and a lot of quick movement. It wasn't easy to address these issues beyond bracing the ships better, and it's particularly difficult to fix when the ship is already completed. 
They tried bracing her sister before her completion and added a few modifications based on Campania's experience to address the problem. Lucania would always have less vibrations than her sister because of these additions. Campania went into dry dock pretty soon after to be braced up, as well as a few changes based on preference. Most significantly, her promenade deck was extended over her forward and aft well decks. That's the part where I'd usually talk about careers, but to be honest with you, they had very standard low accident careers. Campania's refit was successful in increasing the quality of life on board, and now with that out of the way, it's time to show what she's really capable of. In June of 1893, Campania stole the transatlantic speed record, the coveted blue ribbon, from the SS City of Paris. If I had a nickel for every time I had to explain the blue ribbon in a video, I'd have a minuscule increase in my savings. Campania's journey was 5 days, 15 hours, and 37 minutes, a whole hour shorter than the SS City of Paris. She would set another record in August, but a year later, Lucania stole the record from her sister, a record she would set twice more before having it yoinked by the SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa. With the launch of SS Kaiser Wilhelm de Grossa, Cunard no longer held the largest ship in the world. In July of 1900, Campania rammed and sank the SS Imbleton on a foggy day in the Irish Channel. Campania reportedly split the ship in half and caused it to sink in less than a minute. That's pretty metal. In June of 1901, Lucania became the first Cunard ship outfitted with Marconi Wireless, a communication network between ships that allowed them to send out distress calls, warnings, or just to chit-chat through Morse code. Because of this, it meant they were testing the limits of the system by having a constant news report coming in of recent events to the ship that were compiled into a newspaper, which would continue on for years after and would be on ships from Lucania to Lusitania. In 1909, with the launch, completion, and success of the Lusitania and Mauritania, Lucania was laid up in Liverpool and on August 14th caught fire and was deemed unusable. She was scrapped on the spot afterwards. Campania was luckier and lasted until the completion of the enormous Aquitania in 1914, which prompted Cunard to schedule her 250th and final voyage before she'd be laid up like her sister. Global events, however, had other plans, and with the start of World War I, Aquitania was immediately requisitioned by the British government for service as an armed merchant cruiser. Campania was called in to take Aquitania's place, and only served three passenger voyages before being laid up. Cunard planned to sell her for scrap. Ultimately, the Admiralty saved and purchased her, intending to convert her into an armed merchant cruiser, with an onboard flight deck for seaplanes. Interestingly, Charles Lightoller, the senior most surviving officer of the Titanic, served as HMS Campania's first officer in this period. The Admiralty butchered her profile, painting her all dazzly, and removing her forward funnel and replacing it with two smaller ones, and turning her bow into an extended flight deck. Six days before the armistice was signed, Campania collided with the HMS Royal Oak and nearly sank, but continued limping. That was until a boiler explosion sent her to the bottom faster than the Imbleton. Her wreck was blown up by port authorities as it was in shallow enough waters to be a threat to oncoming traffic. So there you have it, the RMS Campania and Lucania. Not well mentioned ships, but certainly worth a video. So what did we learn? A good appearance is nice, but much like the RMS Campania, real beauty is on the inside.